Hey everybody, welcome back to Eggs. This week we have a very special guest, Larry Ludwig. Larry is a longtime entrepreneur and marketer who's helped some of the largest companies in the world achieve new levels of success. Additionally, Larry has owned and sold his own business and is now pursuing his passion of helping other business owners leverage technology and digital marketing to find success of their own. We're really excited for the conversation, so join me in welcoming our guest, Larry Ludwig. Hey, Larry. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, not a problem. Of course. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for making the time for us. Really appreciate it. So before we uh, before we got into recording the show, we just had a little weather talk. So for anybody who's watching the live stream here, uh, you'll notice that each of the three of us are in different locations today. Uh, Mike is stranded in the Pacific Northwest up in uh, Anacortes, Washington in feet of snow. Yeah, uh, literally, there's <laughs> at least a foot and a half on top of the car right now. Yeah, he just texted me a picture <laughs> that was absolutely ridiculous. I'm down in Salt Lake City, where we're usually from. I'm the one stable person, the rock around here. So, and then, uh, and then our guest Larry is out in uh, Long Island. So, uh, so welcome everybody. We're doing a, a, a cross country podcast today. Pretty nice. Yeah, it's nice that the, the the techs out there to be able to do something like this. A few years ago, you just call it off and reschedule. Well, even even still, it doesn't always work to to its plan. I mean, you know, the, obviously the biggest issue I've had is uh, through Skype or other means like Zoom, which we're using here. It's just things get cut off every so often. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, you got to make sure that you're talking quick and you get out those questions because you never know when uh, when the technology gods are going to frown on you. Yeah, yeah knock on wood. <laughs> don't don't jinx us here, Ryan. That's right. So cool. Well, so Larry, why don't you talk a little bit about your past? Like, let's talk about to how you got to where you're headed. Let's, let, you know, it seems like from the information I've got on you that maybe you started a career in marketing and advertising. Is that where school took you or or what does your career path look like? So I, okay, I went to um, school in the South. I went to Clemson University, uh, graduated there in 93. And actually, while in '93 when I graduated, I saw really the, the beginnings of the web. I mean, we were literally just the beginnings of the internet and the web. I mean, internet been around prior to that. The web really transformed it to be, instead of really being technical and needing, you know, things like Unet to communicate back and forth, you use the standard web browser. Yeah. It just revolutionized the whole way uh, people are communicating online. And I just knew that was the future of the internet. I mean, even back then, you know, my background being computer science. You know, the, what was really in the rage back then was client server and the web and you know, server technology that we have now is pretty much just a, a, a second evolution of that technology. So I, I knew that really the future was not only going to be ways to market it and promote your business, but also do transactions online. And once I graduated college, I didn't, I tried to find some business that would do web development online. I couldn't really find anything, of course. Again, this is being early 94. And I just started doing stuff on my own with the hopes of maybe one day finding a business that would understand this is the future. And so in 95, I applied for a company called Poppy Tyson in New York City. And they were really the, one of the bleeding edge ad agencies that worked with some of the biggest Fortune 500 companies creating their first versions of the website, including actually working with Netscape at the time. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't work with them, but the, the West Coast division of Poppy Tyson did. Uh, the White House. I mean, I personally worked with some of the first versions of like Chase Bank at the oh, time. Wow. So it was really just starting off <laughs> with the very basics of creating a, ba you know, non-transactional, you know, a, a more of an online brochure, if you will. But that was the future of the internet. And I knew what? that, you know, eventually we're going to get to that point of doing more transactions online. Yeah, no, it's so funny because like, I mean, we, I, I think both Mike and I are maybe just a little bit younger than you, but like both of us came up sort of in that transitionary period where the internet was accessible to a person at home. Like all of a sudden, I mean, of course we had dial up and all that <laughs> stuff. So it was only yeah. semi-accessible, but, um, but nonetheless, like if you wanted to be on the web, you had to build it. And so yeah. there wasn't these, you know, these fancy web builders and, and what you see, what you get type editors that you've got nowadays. And so when, when we were kids, if you wanted to learn, you know, or be able to exist on the internet, you had to learn HTML, you had to learn to do some coding, you know, so both Mike and I are, are from that sort of transitionary era where we, you know, are, are just sort of burgeoning the internet. So I have to imagine things were infinitely more difficult when you when you began working on this. Stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, we were, you know, again, I saw the whole advantage coming from my background being a computer science and also as a database administrator prior to doing stuff online. I knew that you really need to take a database and somehow link it up to a website. That's and the hardest part for me yeah. is like I went connecting the database and actually doing the SQL 
queries and everything that that I that's where I cut off. I can do the design, but to tie in the database in, I'm no good. <laughs> well, I, I mean, ironically, from a skill set, usually there's a division of labor. You know, from from the early days, you really had designers creating the front end, and a programmer would really do the back end. There's really very rare, I, from my experience at least, that people had experience in both ends or did very well in both ends. So. I had the more back end experience and worked with designers to create that visual front end. Again, like you said, back then there was no there was no WordPress that you just instantly could create a blog or a website. You literally had to create stuff from scratch. And we were doing just that. It was really the stone age in terms of technology. I mean, we take stuff so for granted nowadays, but back then it was just impossible to really or not impossible, very difficult to build, say, a dynamic website that's database driven. Yeah. Nowadays we do it in WordPress in 10 minutes, we're up and running. Yeah, it's crazy how far it's come. Um, instead of like creating all the database fields and then tying into the the front end and doing the queries and all that, it's you can just hit a button and it's installed. And hey, here's a plugin for WordPress that does exactly what you need and minimal at work, and it's ready to go. It's, yeah, which it's, is great though. I mean, from a business owner uh, standpoint, for an entrepreneur, you really there's no excuse to do stuff online. It's so easy that you can do things again back when I first started doing personalization or doing, you know, tracking the user through a site was just not possible. It was very difficult. We discussed there was books that discussed this stuff, this whole one on one communication medium. But it was just not really feasible at the time because of the technology just wasn't there yet. Where nowadays we can do things like in WordPress very easily. Yeah, no, it's true. And uh I mean the the way technology keeps moving, I mean God, you can barely keep up with it now. Um, so after a few years at, uh, at Poppy Tyson, you moved on to Commerce One, which is kind of a successful startup in 98, it sounds like. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that experience and what that was like? It sounds like, you know, web technology had evolved a little bit. Now you were starting to do integrations with B2B uh, solutions for companies. So yeah, there's a little I mean, bit of a, I guess, the next step or, you know, the future was beginning to arrive. Yeah, I mean, prior stuff was more... C to B, where B to B, Commerce One, or I called it eventually Commerce None, in the <laughs> sense of uh, they eventually went bankrupt, you know, in retrospect, in 2001. <laughs> but it was an interesting ride where I was, I think, what, the 60th employee or something like that. They were based in the Valley. And they were just not, I mean, it was interesting as far as the whole startup. I never really worked for a startup. There's a lot of people from Sybase and Netscape that worked at this company. And it was interesting from a... Um, just the growth of the business, how quickly it grew in the valuations. Again, this is during the dot-com bubble. And you had people going, well, it's not about, you know, income. It's about eyeballs. Or in this case, it was about, you know, how much we did from the B2B transactions through this system. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, I was knowing, well, we only did $30,000 in transactions so far. But yet, we were evaluated at like $7 billion or something. Isn't that like the, the WeWork model? <laughs> that, that's exactly, well, there is, I mean, yeah, there's... It, History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. It's also often said, but you're right. There is that, that valuation aspect where you know, Commerce One, I left after they went public, but four or five months after I left, they went public. And again, the stock just went through the roof. And again, it was just crazy valuations at the time. And I guess for mine, I was really concerned, like, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't add up. This doesn't, doesn't sound rational at the time. Even, and I had friends that on paper were worth literally millions. And they had these, you know, phantom stock gains that they owned or owed to the IRS, in their cases, wound up losing their shirts because in the end, the company went, you know, in retrospect, the company went bankrupt uh, about only three years later after they went public. But yet at one point, it was worth, I think, $20 billion or something like that. So were, were they the, the predecessor to like PayPal or what, what was the platform used for? I, I don't recognize the name and, and hadn't dealt with them before. So what um, were you working on? It was working, I was actually helping integrate the products into the various companies that I worked with. But in terms of the, comp the product itself and what Commerce One did, it was more instead of, you know, at the time the rage was Amazon and, you know, the whole C to B, where the whole goal for this was let's automate procurement behind the scenes for, let's say, staples or, you know, staplers or shares or something, office supplies. So instead of having to go to, you know, 10 different vendors, you do it all through a website. So therefore, the, the purchase managers within these companies and buy these products and services and not have to go to 10 different websites. It was all uh, to be like through an intranet. And it was allowing them to make it easier, make it easier for not only people to have all these products through one website, but allow it to purchase very, you know, on demand or on, when they needed it, as opposed to before it was much more manual, you know, P order, P -O, I mean, purchase order. You had to go through manually and purchase these services. And it just was time consuming and a lot of red tape and a lot of paperwork. 
the goal for Commerce One was to try to eliminate all that those steps and automate it and put it online. So it, it was revolutionary in that sense, but it was also <laughs> for a product that was uh, was very expensive to implement and very t- it took many months or if not years in some cases to implement. And that was really the downfall of the company when the recession hit in 2000, 2000 2001 it really slowed it down to where there were no new sales and it eventually collapsed because of there was just no one buying the product. And from one point, again, from only a year and a half, two years prior, they were really doing well you know, as far as income is concerned, but they spent, you know, like going out of style. That's so they, crazy. they eventually went bankrupt, you know, within a year and a half. So and now how, that's nuts. How long were you there and, and what did you do uh, post bankruptcy? Did you, was that pretty much the end for you or did you leave before that? I, I left before, well, I left before they went public. So I, oh, I okay. rode the wave and I actually, I had the advantage if I had uh, stock options that were already vested because I left the company and I could sell them anytime I wanted where, you know, people getting, working at Commerce One at the time, this is typical of a lot of startups. They have, you know, vesting periods and times you can decide to exit. And if you're an employee, you're more limited usually. So what happened was these people would, my friends of mine would have stock options that were not fully vested, but yet again, in the end, they wound up being worthless. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, I, I left at the right time, and had was approached by a, a few people that were clients of mine through another business, a little side hustle I had for hosting, in 1999. So I decided to go off and do that full time instead. So, so were you? Were, did you set up your own server and and uh, host their own <laughs> stuff and run it? I mean, like 99. Yes. That's a, a long time ago to be able to be able to self-host. <laughs> yeah, you actually literally would uh, actually document this on my site. Um, on LarryLedwood.com. So it literally created a, a, yeah, you had to create your own servers. In this case, it was no, there was no like, you know, rack-mounted servers. It was literally a, a tower desktop. Yeah. And you, we put it into a data center and we were hosting, you know, you know, sites on this one server. You know, if it went down, the whole business went down. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, much different than nowadays with cloud hosting and all that <laughs> stuff going on. It, it was much, much more difficult. You had to build it yourself. So you went and did that after this, um, did, was the, the revenue there to support you or, or did you, I'm with the stocks and everything, I'm, I'm sure you were probably fine, but, um, going and starting your own server and hosting account that can't be cheap. And then developing clients and building from there, was that your full-time gig or just a side hustle? It was a side hustle at the time, but again, I had, um, fellow clients that weren't really interested in, you know, they approached me wanting to do it full-time. So they helped fund some of the operations where also the, the business itself did generate some revenue, nowhere near the revenue at the time to hope really, you know, afford me full time. But I had their backing to some degree, helped me grow the business. So I, ironically, though, that was my first, so that was my first stint to really going full time to owning my own business. Sure. And the, the ironic thing is being at the time I was single, didn't really have any other debt. I was nervous to really do it, ironically, where nowadays I laugh at myself thinking like, how stupid I was. I didn't have any dependents. I didn't have, you know, wife. I didn't have children <laughs> where it yeah, was in retrospect. That was the easiest time to start. It was the easiest time to do it. But either needless to say, so I created that in 99 with the two other partners and did that for a few years with those partners. It just wasn't really a good fit because they, they had other existing businesses that did very well, but just didn't understand web hosting, web development. So I decided to exit and brought on another partner during that same period. So that was until 2000. 2005, where he also decided to exit. And then from then on, from 2005 to eventually last year when I shut, or this year, actually, 2019, I shut down my web hosting finally after, what, 15 plus 20 years. Was, oh, wow. that, was that called Empowering Media? Is that the company that? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Empowering Media was the original company name. And I created under that in 2009, uh, another business because I was so frustrated with web hosting, web development. It's such a I guess the biggest issue I have with web hosting, especially it's such a commodity and it's such yeah. a difficult business to be in. I just was getting frustrated with working with various clients and not respecting the work I was doing. And it was not just me, but I had other people as well. Sure. But it was just not really paying. It was paying the bills and I grew the business dramatically after I, I, the, the second partner uh, left the business, but it was just not happy. It was, I was seeing others growing their businesses and helping them grow those businesses but yet not really seeing any huge income growth on my side of the business. Right. So I decided why not, again, this is 2009, create a business that was based on affiliate marketing. And I created a site called Investor Junkie and grew that from zero to you know, 300,000 unique visitors a month in 2018. 
Right. All based forward. on the investment platform on, on just, um, it, it, I mean, going off the name, that's what it kind of reads to me. Um, what was the, what, your clientele that you're going for, for investing well, junkie? Well, with, with investor junkie, I had, I knew it was really the, the, with some experience with my web hosting, I knew affiliate marketing was the way to really monetize it because of, I had, you know, domain registration, SSL certificates. I was able to red, use those and do it through affiliate marketing. I also saw other businesses that were sold in 2009, 2010. One of them being uh, Bankaholic was sold for $12 million in 2008, I want to say. And this was a, literally a one-man show. Huh. And I'm like, if this guy could grow this business and sell it for that amount of money, I knew there was definitely potential for affiliate marketing. So from that, I knew affiliate marketing was the way to go. And I did that meaning you would basically have reviews of various products and services and monetizes instead of traditional ad banners. So I didn't actually have any courses or anything else on this website. It was all through affiliate marketing. That's crazy. Well, so maybe let's take a half a step back and just sort of explain what affiliate marketing is to people who may not be aware. Uh, you know, we're throwing it around pretty casually, but I think for, for some people, they may not be clear on what that means. Sure. Uh, raise his hand right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, affiliate marketing, the simplest way to think of it is you're, you're selling someone else's product or service and you get commission only if the transaction happens, whatever that, that transaction is defined as. I Meaning it could be as simple as an email address to actually buying a product or service. Okay. And the, the, the merchant actually defines what that, that transaction is. Okay. So Therefore... Like Oh, so I was going to say, so like common, common programs might be like Amazon's affiliate program where you use one of their links. And if somebody completes the pre uh, transaction on their website, then you get a little kickback, a penny or something. For, exactly. For well, not a penny, but I mean, Amazon being the most popular and probably the first affiliate program out there. I mean, they, their commissions are anywhere from like three or 4% to maybe 8% the top end. It's really not that profitable. And unfortunately, though, it is the mo it's most popular and most often started with, as far as affiliate marketing is concerned, to go down this path. But it's usually, believe it or not, I think it's the worst program to do. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do it personally. But needless to say, that's one, that's one simple example. Uh, there's, again, there's pretty much every, every company out there has an affiliate program one way or shape or form or another. And if they don't, you can easily approach them and say, hey, look, you're doing that. We see you're doing advertising over here. With, it's not so effective because, again, it's based on cost per click usually. Why don't you do a cost per action in your CPA? We only get paid if the transaction, whatever, again, you define to be successful, happens. So, therefore, it's to your advantage to create an affiliate program. So, I mean, I, in fact, recommend any business, small or large, if you don't have an affiliate program, you should think of it at some level to have one. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So to now understanding what affiliate marketing is, let's go back to uh, Investor Junkie. So, I mean, Investor Junkie, at least for me, based on what I'm seeing in, in sort of a work history and things like that, seems like a little bit of a departure. How did you, like, how did it occur to you to build a website, you know, in theory, teaching people how to invest or, or showing people great unbiased investment information? Yeah. Uh, like, you know, I guess, A, what was the sort of the thought that led to a website like that, being that you were coming from technology and hosting and all this other stuff? Why, why investing? And then second of all, how did the affiliate marketing work in there? Um, well, I always had an active interest in investing. So again, this is after the financial crisis of 2008. And I'm like, you know, I, I wasn't hurting financially by, by no means, both in terms of uh, with hosting, you pretty much get paid every month. And it's great. It's a really uh, needed service. So therefore, I was not affected as much as many other businesses in 2008, 2009. And the same notion too, I'm like, getting frustrated with the clientele I was working with getting bored a little bit too and wanted to branch off into other things. Again, having some experience with affiliate marketing with my web hosting business. But so I, I thought of, initially I created the site as a kind of a skunk works to think, okay, I can showcase, at worst, I can showcase, here's, here's a website that can scale. And here's using, you know, the technologies behind the scenes to really scale this blog, be it WordPress and all the other things that needed to come with it. And here's, you know, for my clientele, here's, here's how to do it. So I wanted to kind of showcase it at worst case, but at best case, I thought about maybe I can monetize it through affiliate marketing. And the ironic thing is it turned into be much more profitable of a business than I ever expected. So when you say that you start making money on affiliate marketing, obviously, I mean, we do this by driving traffic to, to the people who we are affiliates for, and we, you know, basically get our little kickbacks or whatever. How do you, 
I guess, start driving traffic? Like, I mean, it seems easy enough to run out, you know, throw up a web page today with, you know, 12 Amazon links on it, you know, or whatever, but I mean, have them refresh every 10 <laughs> seconds and, yeah, but, you know, but ultimately we need people to follow through and, and complete yeah. the action. And so, you know, I mean, we've tried some affiliate marketing, uh, with this show, for example, and, and have had very little success, you know, cause ultimately it depends on somebody following through and doing the whole thing. Yep. So how do you, on a website like this, I mean, was it just that you determined, uh, investing investment information was valuable. People were seeking it out. Therefore you had traffic and that led to great affiliate return or, you know, or was there some other trick to it? Well, I mean, first year and a half. This is a common question I get too. It's the first year and a half, I didn't do so well. And in fact, I was almost to the point of thinking of quitting. And because of uh, one is the monetization wasn't there. The other was the audience. It was just taking a while to build, build an audience. I think it, for any, you know, be it affiliate marketing or anything you're doing with a blog, it's not, you know, create in two weeks or two months and you're instantly a success. It takes a really time to build up that traffic, especially if you're doing SEO. Uh, it just takes time. It takes time to become an expert and authority in that space and really get your your voice, if you will. If you really under you know understand your audience and you under, you really talk to them on various you know services and and then also how then it how to properly monetize it. Your point, what you're alluding to, most affiliate people that do affiliate marketing very make very little money. I, mm -hmm. I think most it's under a thousand, under two thousand a month, or if not in some cases under ten thousand a year. Yeah. It's usually not a successful business. Well, and it seems like, I mean, uh, you know, obviously if you have a, a website that's getting decent traffic or something, then it would be kind of a no brainer, right? I mean, this is almost free money, you know, I'll put up your ad and, and then I get paid for people clicking on your ad. Well, but if you yes, have no traffic, how do you develop that audience? Well, keep in mind, unlike, you know, traditional ad banners, which are CPC, you know, cost per click, you get paid if they click on it. Or there's also ones you just, if, you, if they view the ad, you get paid as well. But with um, affiliate marketing, you only get paid if they buy you know, something. That actually, yeah, they buy something that action occurs. So it's a little different. If anything, what matters more in affiliate marketing is the quality of the traffic. It's not a matter of how much traffic, you know, you can have, I use the example of Pinterest, you know, Pinterest is a great platform for certain products and services. But for say investing, it was horrible. You know, you I may get say 50,000 visitors in a certain a few months with Pinterest, but the audience was not appropriate for investing. So therefore, they would bounce off, they would not convert, it'd be horrible for affiliate marketing where the, going back to ad banners would be perfect for that type of medium. So you really have to understand what, with affiliate marketing that it's more the quality of the traffic, not the quantity, and getting the right person to the right service. And that's where our reviews and our comparison tools that we created helps that facilitate that. In other words, I didn't want to just get a conversion and be done with it. I wanted to really make sure we sent the right person to the right service that was appropriate for them. And you know, we discussed all the various, you know, positives and negatives of that service as opposed to just, you know, I, I think a lot of people see through now with affiliate marketing that you're just hawking this product for the commission. And in the end, mm -hmm. I think it hurts your brand and you're doing it for a quick win where in the long term, I've seen many people do that game and disappear in only a few years, if that. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, well, and I think that that's an important distinction you make, the uh, the difference between quality over quantity. I think we're at a point in society right now where everybody is sort of chasing the likes and things like that. And, and you know, likes don't mean anything. <laughs> so, I don't know, man. I got five likes on my Instagram today. I know. Well, and it feels great for the warm fuzzies. But yeah. in, ter in terms of affiliate marketing or driving traffic someplace, um, you know, those four or five likes just they don't amount to much. Yeah. Or, you know, 10,000 likes maybe doesn't even amount to much. You know, I mean, yeah. it's... It's well, interesting. It's akin to what, what I saw in, is. yeah. It's akin to what I saw in the '90s. The the whole you know just get eyeballs to the web page. You know that right. that really would, would counted. And nowadays it's the same thing with likes or shares. It, you know, it doesn't help if it doesn't help convert that product, be it you know your own product or service or something through you know affiliate marketing. What matters is the conversion, and I think people lose sight of that. So what's like a, a good you know, standard practice for getting people to convert and then setting up, I, I assume like a click funnel and trying to get them in the right area and get them going. What's like best practices for you um, in your business in the investment world? And and did you do anything different from like the Rand Fishkins and the, the guys in the SEO world that kind of, kind of set it all up? Well, I, I mean, the one thing that I, I, I found interesting that I learned during this process. So during, again, from 2009 to last year, I really learned, I knew about SEO before that, but I really got into the, the weeds, if you will, on how SEO worked and then how it's related to not only affiliate marketing, but overall how it really is tied into a sales funnel. 
it's instead of through paid traffic, through you know paid ad that you do, SEO is really the same thing except it's free. And I think most people lose sight of that fact where certain keywords are much more transactional than others. So you really have to think about, you know, I use the example, what is a mortgage is less transactional than what's the best mortgage rate. And Google also really looks at those cues depending on your content. If you really are pushing hard for, say, affiliate commission or what is a mortgage, you're not going to rank really well for that keyword because of Google's knowing, hey, this keyword is not really that transactional. We're seeing a lot of transactional information on this page or links that go to the, the various merchants you're working with. We don't want to see that. We want to have more value add. We want to add, make sure the reader gets information out of reading this article as opposed to converting for what's the best mortgage rate. So that's one of the things you have to think about with SEO is there's definitely, there's a, a pendulum, if you will, of how much transactional a page can be. You really need to be appropriate for that and look at what's out there currently. If you're, if, if you're trying to rank for best mortgage rate, you should look what the competition's doing and ultimately try to, at minimum, mimic it, but make it better and improve on what the ad value that they're maybe currently not doing. So um, I write an article on my WordPress page. I've got Yoast SEO. I've got a few other plugins that are designed to help with SEO. What are like the, the main elements that are driving Google to, when they crawl your site, reference you? Is it like the hashtags? Is it the content that you write? Is it the... Um, keywords. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can put in on like the sidebar that yeah. supposedly help, but I honestly don't know what I'm doing when it comes to that world. So I don't know what to focus on or what content's actually delivering the results. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I, I think nowadays, the, 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 the funny thing is I think 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even, it was less, it was about gaming Google. You could develop techniques like, okay, put this information in your keywords and therefore, you rank high for this, this page. And honestly, Google is much smarter than that nowadays, not only in terms of backlinks, but also the content. It really looks at the content at, and mimics more what a user is doing and looks at the, what the users are doing on your site and therefore says, okay, these people think this content's crap. We're not going to rank it. At one point, we did rank it high for this keyword or the keywords. We're no longer going to rank it high because if the bounce rate is just way too high. The time on page. Can, can you define the bounce rate? What, what do you mean by that? Bounce rate means where they click on the link and they immediately bounce back to Google search. Google oh, okay. looks at that as one metric to say, this content is really not relevant or not related to what this keyword is currently ranking for. Over time, it will start decreasing that page in the ranks because it just knows it's not relevant and start bubbling up other content it thinks is relevant based on oh, okay. the time on page, the bounce rate, other things, other metrics you know, going to that, that article. So it really l tries to mimic what a person's doing on a page and or gets feedback from the users on your page to figure out how this thing should rank. So it's much more about creating good content as opposed to thinking, okay, I got a game, again, game Google to put these keywords in the, the H1 tag or the title tag or something like that, where again, those techniques no longer work and really haven't worked for many years. So you what really you're saying is, is we can't go and leave like paragraphs of text that are the same color as our background at the bottom of our <laughs> hey, web pages stop anymore? giving me crap for that. That was 10 years ago. <laughs> that used to work, though. <laughs> I, just had, I used to do it, too. Yeah, I mean, that was a trick. It was, it, and it's funny that, I mean, it, it's, it's a good, in my eyes, it's all net positive for my eyes. One is it's part of the game. I mean, there's still cases where people game the system. But overall, it allows people to create good content. It's, it's really focusing on better user experience for Google and for the users themselves. That's not to say there's not issues with Google and Google sometimes gets it wrong or other issues with Google and the content itself. But ultimately, I think in the past 10 years, I've seen Google get much better in this process. And I think it's net positive for everyone in this uh, industry. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, so I guess, you know, Mike was asking some questions about SEO. Maybe we we'll, can dig in on that just a little bit more. Um, what, do you, what do you think are like, I mean, now that we know that we can't game the system anymore, like what, you know, I mean, what I guess makes better content? And maybe this goes back to that idea of, of building audience and things like that. So maybe we can make this one big conversation. But like, if we're out there and we're producing content every day and I mean, cause Google's not reporting to us and saying, Hey man, sorry, we don't like your, your article, you know, sorry, we don't, well, we don't they, have the same beliefs. They are though. I, I disagree with that statement because of the, in the way they are giving you feedback based on your ranking. If you, you just have to tools, look for it though. Is, is exactly. Yeah. yeah. There, you can use tools like Ahrefs. Ahrefs is a really cool tool. It's not free by any means, but it's a great tool to show our time. Are you getting better? It's really demystifying that black box that Google has 
and look over time. Are you getting better? Or are you getting worse? Is the content you're creating, you know, helping increase your rankings or is it making it worse? You look at, um, you know, overall the stats in Google Analytics as well can leave clues, meaning is the bounce rate for those readers going down? Are the time on page going up? Are, are the people visiting more pages on your site? You know, things like that. Those are cues that Google says, this page, this site is more important. Therefore, we should rank it higher in the set keywords. So is, the, is Google the end-all be-all or is Facebook Pixel worth dealing with? I, I've done a little bit of reading on Pixel, but I've never actually implemented anything with it. And is that more for like a like a online, like a clicking and setting up a, a sales funnel from Facebook to, to lead? Isn't that the yeah. only reason you would use it? Yeah, I mean, Facebook's Pixel is really for paid traffic. And it, not to say you shouldn't have it installed, by all means, in fact, you should have it. I mean, what I've recommended and discussed on a recent blog post on LarryLedwood.com is the whole idea of um, SEO becoming, right now SEO is anywhere from 50 to 80% of traffic for all uh, people out there. And it's, if anything, it's been, been decreasing over the past 10 years. So I use the, the example of for rank number one, uh, 2014, you get 38% of all traffic. Nowadays, it's about 31% for the same ranking number one position for that same keyword. Hmm. It's because of Google's pushing down with more ads, more featured snippets, they're called. In other words, you know, getting the, the information. For, yeah, posts, exactly. Yeah. Getting more information at the very top to answer that question before you even click into your website. So therefore, the click-through rate to your website is decreased, you know, significantly in the past, you know, eight, 10 years almost. So therefore, I think it's only, that trend's only going to continue. Google wants to make sure it answers all the information as much as possible before going to someone's other, someone else's website, which makes sense. So therefore, you got to look at paid traffic and where Facebook Pixel or Google's Pixel for that matter matters is making sure you can then properly um, you know, use other means to get your audience to your website, be it now through paid traffic as opposed to just search. Are, speaking of search, I mean, and maybe just uh, to back up Mike's question, are there any other relevant search engines? I mean, like, uh, you know, we, we talk about Google, everybody talks about Google, <laughs> but I mean, does it platforms or like is the work we're doing for Google, uh, you know, going to optimize us for these other sites as well? I mean, Bing is, I think, a underserved or a platform most people ignore, both in terms of organic traffic and paid traffic. Again, it depends on your audience. Uh, I had on Investor Junkie, I had an audience that was much older demographic. So therefore, it worked very well with Bing because of they left it as their default search engine. They had they didn't know better. Nice. So, <laughs> and paid traffic worked really well. So there, people often ignored uh, you know Bing's uh, search traffic or paid traffic, I should say, where it works exactly the same as Google Ads. So by all means, if you're successful on Google Ads, you should at least take a look at Bing's ad as well. Uh, that you have obviously Amazon is a very popular search and believe it or not, I think it's ranked number three in popularity of search. As so an by engine, all means, as just yeah, a as search an engine. engine. I never yeah. even thought to try that. Without question. You should definitely, if you, if you can get a book or some means to sell a product or service on Amazon, you know, some people use it as a loss leader. They just put, you know, their products on Amazon, not to hope and make a profit, but at least get their brand out there. So. so um, I'm sorry to sidetrack. This is just a personal question and, and it probably has nothing to do with anything we're talking about. But uh, my uncle has a, a, a radio shack in, in Idaho and it's kind of a smaller market and it's not really taken off. But he also has like third party products that he sells through his radio shack. And I've I've tried to talk to him about setting up an online store through Amazon and be able to sell some of his product do a shipment kind of thing, but I've never gone down that road. It, um, it's selling a physical product on Amazon uh, and creating up a merchant account and a service. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been down that road with a client? Are there any tips and tricks that you could maybe recommend for something um, like that? I mean, the problem is with anything like Amazon, just like with uh, organic traffic is you don't own the platform. So same thing with Facebook, you're, you're relying on another, a third party to, uh, you know, bring revenue in. So it's a, it's a risk. So I would not, I would think of it as one channel. That's the first and foremost, not, you shouldn't be your only channel. So in your case of, you know, with, with your, um, with the business is making sure you just have it as one channel and have a website as well. So you really should diversify. Uh, with that said, I have not personally done Amazon just because I, again, I don't deal with mostly physical products, sure. but it's, I have friends that do very well on it because it's just one channel, but it's not their only channel. 
so would you recommend someone like him setting up his personal website to as a sales platform on there and then having Amazon as another how would you manage inventory? Well, like one one example is uh, like with Shopify, and I'm sure there are mm -hmm. others that do this, but I just happen to know the Shopify platform. You can load your products, services, whatever into Shopify, and you can push them directly into Amazon via you know their their APIs and things. So so for example, if your personal website was built on a Shopify platform, or you know among others. Um, that inventory control, all those things that you build in uh, that are built into Shopify would be sort of carried through to whichever vendors you push out to Amazon being one, but there are other channels you can push to as well. So. Okay. Sorry to yeah, sidetrack us. No, that's a good question though. <laughs> there, there, but my point is going back to the original question is there, there's definitely ways to you know, Google's shouldn't be the only all be all. And there's other channels. You should ha definitely have email. You should definitely use social media. You should definitely have other channels besides just Google. Not only because if you're relying on just, one, again, one channel, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. Should that, you know, should Google decide to update their algorithm like they're doing this, this, this current month in January, it could be a huge upset for your blog, you know, or your website. You can literally lose, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% of your traffic overnight. I've seen that wow. happen. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, so maybe then uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the things you just mentioned was email marketing. And I, I had uh, some interest in, in asking you about, again, sort of just this idea of audience development. Like I happen to notice at LarryLudwig.com, you can download a, uh, a free sheet that gives you some information. I think it's an SEO document or something like that. I just, affiliate, just marketing. That. Yeah. affiliate marketing. That's right. And so, um, you know, so this is one method for collecting email addresses and building your own platform, you know, uh, to your point about the, uh, you know, not having all your eggs in somebody else's basket, you know, that you've got this third party relationship with an Amazon or a Google who can do whatever they want with you. Yep. Um, by developing your own email list, you sort of own that list. You're able to manage your own audience and manage your own people and be in touch with your own people and so you're not beholden to these you know third-party overlords so well, yes you to, no though i, I okay. find interesting yeah let's I mean, talk about that a little bit i mean I, I, the the interesting thing is you hear other internet marketers go okay i own you know i own the money is in the list and you should have a mailing list and i totally agree with that but you're still beholden to getting the email delivered so you may actually have an email address uh, but if if you you know if your email goes into a spam folder you're kind of screwed Mm -hmm. And it's no, or even worse, you know, the, the other worst issue is actually Google tabs. You have the other tabs now, the promotions tab, for example. Uh, you know, it can, I've seen the studies, it decreases your open rate by 10%. So, by all, and Google is being the biggest email provider. So, you're still beholden to Google at some level, even if you use email. So, it's not necessarily uh, a free lunch, if you will. But, but you do have, you know, contacts that you can then use to say remarket through Facebook. You, you, in other words, you export that email list to, Facebook and use as a list to create a lookalike audience or, or do some of the advanced techniques where remarketing to them and can't making you, sure they what? can't you niche down in Facebook and in those kind of things and actually get direct demographics of exactly what you're looking for based off of the people on your mailing list. Most definitely. Uh, I mean, they've made it a little bit more obscure in the past few years because of the issues they've had with privacy, but yes, you can definitely, you can segment your audiences by uploading your say customer base in Facebook. And then what will happen is to say, okay, based on these current customers you have, let's create a lookalike audience. And from that, let's market it the same way. And you, you can have pretty good success with it. In other words, Google uses it all through your know, computer model to determine which audience will more likely to be buying, buying your same product. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, no, I actually have some experience with that, that um, taking and building sort of the lookalike audience and things. And it, and it really is pretty incredible. I mean, we generated a, a list of survey respondents for a product I was trying to launch and, uh, and, and did that thing, loaded it right up into to Facebook. And yeah, I mean, basically everyone's on Facebook. So they have those email addresses, they know who those people are, and they can look at their, you know, behaviors and, and make determinations on how to, you know, build an audience that has similar behavior. So yep. it's a, it's very interesting. And it's, I mean, it's, kind of a crazy thing that you can do that, but, but it is, it is amazing. I mean, in the end though, you, you should look at any of the platforms as you're renting that platform, be it SEO, be it Facebook groups, you're renting that platform and you should think of it as that way. You really want to get them onto your web. The ultimate goal is you should be getting into a mailing list, a membership site, some area that you have more control over because you lack that control through Facebook groups for example. 
Yeah, no, I think that makes perfect sense. And and I like that uh, analogy or that idea of, of renting the platforms. I think a lot of times it just, I don't know, we get kind of in this loop where it feels like we're in control, you know, like it feels like as, <laughs> as we're buying ads and doing whatever yeah. on Facebook, like, you know, oh yeah, no, this is my thing. I can cruise through here. I can use this platform, you know, and you don't think about the the times when, you know, Google pulls the rug out from under you and uh, changes yeah, the algorithm or whatever. Yeah, I've seen that happen. Unfortunately, I've had a few friends and I was even affected to a degree at one point with my business with Investor Junkie. I had a, um, a basically what's called a negative SEO attack, and it affected my ranking over time. I where I lost thirty percent of the traffic, and from that, thirty percent of the revenue. Is so, that just that a, happened, is that just a competitor competitor trying to mess with your numbers and and make you look bad, or or I mean, why would someone why would why would that happen? Yeah, exactly. You had a competitor. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's hard to prove that you have negative SEO, but for the most part, it pretty much was guaranteed based on the various factors. So I, from that, in the end, I had a rec- I eventually recovered, but it took work. And from that, I also gained a lot of knowledge of how SEO even worked during that period. So I really helped better focus. I mean, again, it was somewhat of an upsetting issue, but in the end, I, I really came out of it, you know, and learned so much from the business. Not only, like I've said, not rely on just one source of traffic, but also understanding how SEO really works because of it really owns the website even more so than before and improves the whole user experience in that process. So uh, Ryan and I have done kind of a brief overview of SEO. I've, I've read uh, uh, Rand Fishkin's book and a few other things, but I haven't really imp- started implementing it in my own site until recently. And so I'm still in kind of the, the, the baby phases of SEO and uh, it's starting to come along. Can you maybe go over an, a broad overview of like best practices for SEO and, and like starting with a fresh post, what would you do to get the best out of performance out of a, a post? That's a great question. I, I think the first and foremost is know or understand who you're writing this for. So, you know, the, the one thing I discuss uh, and I've actually just have a course of mine is I talk about how there's really, you, you can write a post really for three major reasons. One is for SEO. Another one is for uh, social media. And another one is really for your existing audience, be it mailing list, what have you. And you, it's really hard to create a blog post or an article that really satisfies all three audiences. Rand, I think, in fact, discusses in one of his blog posts that you really can, ha- you can really make a, a post that satisfies all three. I kind of disagree. I think you really need to focus on one primary, and maybe if you, you're, you're lucky, you get the other two with it. But for the most part, you need to really focus on one of those three core audiences and then write your post for that, that purpose. And also, if you're doing it for SEO, really understanding as far as intent is concerned. Again, where they are in their, their sales funnel. If they are just starting off with, again, using the example I just mentioned, what is a mortgage? You really should be educating people than you know, saying, here's the rates you should get here's what you should buy. They're not really, they're really exploring a mortgage and wanting to you know, purchase a mortgage for buying a house. And again, with that, there's other supplemental things to think about as well that can go with that same article. You can have links to either outside your website or even within your own website, create future articles or existing articles and link to them. So you really should think of it in a, a more organic and much more holistic way than just purely, I'm ready to post to, you know, write this one post and it just lives in, a, in an island and nothing else is, else is around it. You really need to make sure you have other articles to help supplement it as well. Yeah, interesting. Um, I've heard that link backs are really important. Uh, people linking to your site. Um, how much does that affect your placement? And uh, is it like if, if I, for example, link back to our podcast site from my DJ site and Ryan links back from his uh, mm-hmm. our two media, does that actually affect it? Or is it, you need like a lot of link backs for it to actually make a difference? Well, I would say years ago, any link would count the same. But nowadays it's all about relevancy. Meaning if you, you know, let's use my investor website as an example. If I had an automotive site linked to investor junkie, doesn't matter. No, it doesn't yeah. matter. Google would look at that, go, it's not really relevant. What really matters is another investment blog or another, like a Forbes links to my website, that's highly more related. It has what's called link velocity than compared to an automotive site or a baby website. It really has no relation to investing unless it maybe talked about 529s as an example. But outside of that, you, you have to really think of it. What matters is you want to get other, other websites, other blogs that are related to your business, not outside of your realm. And again, there were years ago where that was not the case. You'd be able to 
people would literally buy backlinks from anywhere. It didn't matter. And Doodle got wise to that and, you know, really updated their algorithms where they look at that, what's the relevancy of this other blog? It kind of, Doodle pigeonholes you into various niches. And you've got to make sure not only do you cover those said topics on your website, but other websites that are linking to you are also related as well. And can it be a negative effect if you have just a bunch of link backs that don't mean anything? They actually look at it like almost a bot did all that. So we're going to drop you off. That's where negative SEO can be a factor. Yeah. I mean, if, if people have wise, somewhat wised up to that and did the exact opposite, linking to, say, porn websites to a <laughs> blog, you left. That's the one way I've seen people do negative SEO is they link to you know, bad websites, bad players, if you will. And Google's kind of downplayed that as well in the recent years. But, you know, again, that was a factor as well is Google you know, didn't, under, didn't think of that. They thought of only the positive and not the negative consequences of these updates. Huh. And yet they eventually figure it out or see the, the negative issues. But in the end, what matters is the, the link. But, but, but there are cases where you can rank, if your overall blog or website is considered quality in the eyes of Google, you can actually rank for a, a somewhat competitive to low competitive keyword instantly without any backlinks. So don't, it's about the quality of the content itself. So I actually had cases where we would rank for content because of we were known as a well-known resource for investing on said topics without any backlinks at all. And it's just, it, just how you build up your, your brand. You, you're ultimately building up a brand where Google looks at you and your readers, for that matter, as a quality resource on that said topic. Interesting. Huh. Okay. So just as we're starting to get here to the end uh, of the show, so recently, as recently as this last year, you sold the, uh, the Investor Junkie website. You are now starting to transition into more of a, I don't know, now you're, I guess, maybe more able to start pursuing some passions and doing the things that are important to you. Exactly. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of where you're headed, you know, what the sort of future trajectory looks like and, uh, and what you're doing now? So I sold it last year, uh, Investor Junkie. Um, you know, I sold it for seven figures. And from that, yeah, I mean, I don't have to, if I wanted to, I could literally not work again if I didn't want to. But it's like any entrepreneur, you always have the gears working. You always yeah. want to do something else. And I, I, from my end, I think there's a lot of opportunities still, not only in affiliate marketing, to really help other businesses, both on the merchant side, but also on the, the blogger side or the publisher side but also just in general, digital marketing. I think there's, you know, based on my background for many years, I, I think a lot of businesses just don't do it right. I think they need a lot of help in this area. And that's where, you know, I created my own personal brand. So instead of creating Investor Junkie, I created it as a brand into itself that could easily be sell, sold. I, you know, really branding myself now as, a, as the expert, as opposed to Investor Junkie being the expert. And now, you know, building out not only courses, but also doing consulting as well. So um, before we totally jump off of an investor junkie, I kind of want to get a, a breakdown of your daily habits with that business. Like what were, what would you do? Would you publish weekly? Would you publish daily? Would you take snippets of your content and reformat it? Like what was your a average week like at investor junkie as a, as the owner and how many people did you have on your team? Was it just you? Was it a whole publishing crew that kind of helped you do it? Um, yeah, those are good questions. Uh, I, so I started off obviously just by myself and I mean, I had a tech, uh, tech person helping with the WordPress hosting and whatnot, uh, with my other business. But after a while, after about two, three years, I hired an editor. I also had other people write for the blog. All those were consultants. So I never had full-time employees for writing, but I had a, a full-time editor. I had someone else to really help with the relationships with the affiliate marketing side and myself. So it was really three people full-time. And the rest were consultants. And I hired eventually an SEO firm to just help, you know, just to under, really work on the SEO for me. I Meaning I just didn't have the time to dedicate to it. And I knew how important it was. And just really hired them to help not only uh, help me with backlinks creation, but also just look through the site from, a th you know, second pair of eyes to see what issues maybe I, I was doing wrong or, or can be improved upon. Uh, but I, yeah, I had a really skeleton crew. I didn't really have a huge staff. It didn't really need it. I think ultimately I'm all about you know, keeping a business lean. Uh, not only because of, you know, with affiliate marketing, you're, the, the two major downfalls with affiliate marketing is you're relying mostly on SEO, unfortunately. And the other is you're relying on other people's products and services. Where those products and services could be shut off, I can say at a moment's notice, but very quickly. 
So one month you can have an affiliate program, next month you could have no affiliate program with that merchant. And um, you're high and dry as far as the source of revenue. It could be a significant source of revenue too. I mean, I, we, you know, we had, I forget how many vendors we worked with, but I think we at the peak, I want to say 50 or 60 different sources of uh, revenue. So it was very diversified, but still some, you know, the 80-20 rule, a good portion mm-hmm. of them generated a significant amount of revenue. So, I mean, in the end, the um, investor junkie was just a, uh, I, I would work on, going back to the other question you asked, I would work on mostly updating content. We came to a point where we had enough content, you're just kind of repeating yourself. And with SEO, it's about improving the existing content. So we spent most of the time, both the editor and I, going through existing articles and seeing where they can be improved and either having ourselves do it or hiring a writer to improve that content. So it was always about improving the content. We were ultimately trying to make sure if someone came to a review or an article on our site, it was updated as of that date. So if a, a, a merchant created a new service, we wanted to make sure people came to that review and read it and said, oh, this is updated as of today. We, you know, we were really 